What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fancy football. I am Nicholas. We're breaking down the top wide receiver sleepers for 2019 fantasy football. Last week, we got into the running back list. So if you missed that episode, I believe it was last Monday, maybe Wednesday. I don't even know at this point. Shit's just a big blur during, during the summer. Go check that out. Today, I feel real confident about this list, man. I was, you know, running backs are tough to spot because most of them are coming from, again, ambiguous backfields and they break in halfway through the year or through an injury. So it's very hard to spot those breakout running backs for the most part. This wide receiver list, though, I'm feeling, mwah. I think this is a really good year. It's obviously going to depend on your draft spot, but I think this is a really good year to go with running backs early, right? Depending on where you are in your fantasy football draft, like where you're picking, what spot, you know, first half, back half, go with running backs early, you know, grab two in the first three rounds, or maybe even three, depending on if, if some running backs fall to you at value, because there is so much value at the end of the draft. Also, like the beginning of the draft this year, it feels like there are a lot of workhorses in the NFL this year, right? The first three rounds are just filled with them. There are not many years that we go into fantasy football and are like, oh, this guy's a workhorse. And so are like these other 10 guys. If you look at like the first 11, 12 running backs off the board in fantasy football this year, you can make an argument that they're all pretty much relatively workhorses for their team, right? So it looks good right now. At the end of the year, we're going to look back and be like, you know, eight of those guys weren't even workhorses for their team. But this year, I think it, wide receiver depth is absolutely stacked. And we say that every year, right? There's, oh, there's always great value rounds eight through 12. But I think there's a lot of guys in that range this year that have uh, a lot more breakout potential, a lot more upside than we usually see throughout the um, throughout fantasy football drafts. It's always like value, but that really doesn't help you win championships. I feel like there's a lot of guys at the end of the drafts now that actually have like really big breakout potential. I also apologize for any of like the long-witted intros. I know a lot of you guys are like, just skip to the fucking player list or whatever. I'm trying to start each video with more of a strategy outlook, right? An overall viewpoint of things that will help you in your fantasy football draft, not just players to draft, players not to draft. Because you know the old saying, man, teach a guy to fish, right? But here at the HQ, you make a man a marg, you can get him drunk. You teach him how to make a beautiful marg, and he can stay buzzed forever. That being said, let's make this cocktail. Going into 2018, right, we're coming off a few years where rookie wide receivers made basically no impact. We got spoiled by the OBJs and Mike Evans is back in like 2014. And last year, I got really excited about this this rookie wide receiver class. Um, some of them had big years. None of them had like absolutely monster years. I would say maybe Calvin Ridley's 10 touchdowns are a big deal. But I had a feeling that this, this class coming into last year was going to be one that kind of changed the landscape of the wide receiver mold in the NFL. And I think that's definitely what we're seeing. Um, so many of these guys are very, 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 very talented. They have their rookie years behind them. And as we explained in the dynasty um, buy low, sell high trade video that I did a couple weeks ago, which I will link in the description as well as down below, you don't have to worry about that rookie year production dip, right? Rookies that come in as wide receivers, very, 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 very low percentages of them actually produce in the beginning, um, in that first year, right? So especially in Dynasty, value sophomore wide receivers over rookie wide receivers who are going around the same area because you already got past that rookie wide receiver dip. And now I feel like sophomore years, you know, they're on their cusp of the breakout. And I think we're seeing that. I think that's where the value is this year in, in redraft and in Dynasty, these sophomore wide receivers. So what I did was I used the Rotoviz game screener app to see if sophomores are still a year away or are they good breakout candidates for fantasy football seasons. Over the last five fantasy seasons, the wide receiver 18, which is what I would consider, that's about a breakout point, right? Top 12 wide receivers are wide receiver ones, then the top 18 are like wide receiver 1.5s, right? Mid wide receiver twos or high end wide receiver twos. Uh, the top 18 wide receivers, I would consider anyone inside that, they had a big year, right? So over the last five seasons, the wide receiver 18 in fantasy has, on average, taken home 178.3 half PPR fantasy points overall on the season. So that's like the mark for finishing as the wide receiver 18 or earlier over the last five years. Since 2000, so over the last, 2010, excuse me, over the last nine years, there have been 26 sophomore wide receivers that have eclipsed that number. So you're looking at nearly three sophomore wide receivers each year that finish inside the top 18 for fantasy on average. 11 of 26 of those, 42.3%, were first round picks. So 26 sophomores over the last nine years break out and become top 18 wide receivers. 11 of 26 had first round draft capital. Seven of 26 were second rounders. So we're looking at about 
70% of those sophomore breakouts or 70% of the sophomores that finish inside the top 18 came from the first two rounds. Three were third rounders. And then after that, the rest is filled with Tari Kill, who was a fifth round pick and then four undrafted free agents. So while the majority are early round picks, definitely the high, high majority of them, they come from all over the place in the draft. Um, and of course we have to take all of that into context. And you know, those ones are easy to spot. The first round picks, the second round picks that will probably be in the top 18. You're looking at, you know, the DJ Moores, the Calvin Ridleys, et cetera. Those are the most likely guys to accomplish the feat, but they're not sleepers. You're gonna need to use, you know, by the time draft comes, you might need to use a late fourth round pick on Ridley or DJ Moore, definitely like a fifth round pick, August, September, come real fantasy football drafts. So let's talk about some some deeper players, some ones that I think could easily hit this mark <clears throat> that weren't necessarily first round or even second round picks. First guy up on this list is Kiki QT of the Houston Texans. I just grabbed him in the Scott Fishbowl. I will probably be grabbing a lot of him. Right now he's going off the board around pick 90, wide receiver 35. QT missed most of his rookie season with hamstring issues, which eventually led to other issues, which pushed his first NFL appearance all the way back to week four. So he missed, you know, preseason, summer, and a lot of the early season of the regular season, that's that's really dampering to a rookie's outlook, right? You need that on-field time to gain chemistry with the players around you, the quarterback, just learning the system and getting comfortable on the field. So he didn't get on the field until week four. But when he did, he caught 11 of 15 targets for 109 yards in his debut. He became a, a go-to target for Deshaun Watson like right off the rip. Those 11 receptions he had in his rookie season were the most by any wide receiver any NFL wide receiver in their debut, at least since 1965. That is a ridiculously good debut for Kiki QT, who didn't play anything before that because of the injuries that were uh, that were hampering him, right? QT is a good, 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 good prospect coming out of college as well. 4-4-3, four, 40-yard four, dash. So he's very fast over the middle of the field, easily able to create separation against NFL defenders. Monster college production coming out of last year. 93 catches, 1,429 receiving yards, 10 touchdowns. And last year, I know it was a limited sample size, but he was awesome in this limited sample size in 2018. In the four games, Kiki QT played in 45% or more of Houston's snaps. So basically when he was healthy, when he was on the field, you know, 50% of the snaps, his per game numbers, actually it's not per game numbers. Obviously I just fucking type out typos all day and I don't read my tweets when I tweet them out, but his overall numbers, <clears throat> 36 targets, 25 receptions, 270 receiving yards and a touchdown. So if you break that up by four games, that's nine targets, a little bit over six receptions a game, 67.5 receiving yards. That was off the rip. Let's go. Only had one touchdown, but those are going to be volatile with um, year over year with these wide receivers. If you pace that out to a full 16 games, 144 targets, 100 receptions, 1,080 receiving yards, four touchdowns. That pace does not include his monster playoff game against Indy, where he saw 14 targets, 11 receptions, 110 receiving yards, and a touchdown. That works out to a target share of 28%. And yes, Houston's receiving core, mainly Will Fuller, who was banged up most of the year, I get that. But Will Fuller played in three of those games, of those four games, and Demarius Thomas played in the other one. Um, so they were active in four of those games, four of those five games that I listed. And DeAndre Hopkins obviously played the full season, so he was always active. So I don't think it was a product of just simply being forced into heavy usage. I think Kiki QT is a great, great prospect. And I got this um, I got this comment on YouTube a few weeks ago. Can you talk more about why you're so high on QT? Man, only got 287 yards and touchdown. The only thing I think is impressive about a small sample size last year was the 68% catch rate. My answer, as I've already kind of explained to you guys, dude came in the league with a bad hamstring as a rookie. He played in seven games overall, if you include the one playoff game. Seven games, keep that in mind. He had individual game lines, 11 for 109, six for 51 and a touchdown, five for 77, 14 for 110 and a touchdown. I think that last one's supposed to be 11 for 110 and a touchdown. So you're looking at four big game, like four really, really good, useful games in your fantasy lineup out of seven during his rookie year. So that's more than a 50% hit rate. That's more consistency than you're getting out a lot of players in the NFL at this point, right? And I think one of the big things here is like, we're talking about Cooper Cup coming back from his ACL tear. We're talking about all these other guys coming back from their injuries that are big injuries with big timetables. Yeah, Will Fuller tore his ACL at the end of October, had his surgery early November. And as we know from Dr. Morse, this is a, a real nine to 12 month return timetable. I don't care that Bill O'Brien keeps coming out and saying, he'll be ready for week one, he'll be ready. Because listen, two months ago, he was full go for training camp. 
what happens when training camp comes? He's not fucking full go. They push you back and say, he'll be ready for week one. This is how these things go. They just tell you that they're going to be ready. And then when the timetable actually gets there, science takes hold of that shit and tells you, no, that was fucking fake news. And people just buy it so they can get away from them and stop asking them, when's his return timetable? When's his return? So they just say training camp, OTAs, week one. That's why that's all you hear. They don't actually have timetables. But science tells us nine to 12 months after a early November ACL tear, He's not going to be full strength until the beginning of the season, if that. And that's just physically. He needs to get all the muscles around the ligament and all that stuff fully repaired, fully healthy, as well as being mentally there. You know, Dr. Morse always says, we don't want the guys one year removed from ACL tear. We want them two years after because they're not going to be full strength until two years afterwards. So I think that's being super underplayed because we're like, oh, you know, if Will Fuller's on the field, is QT really going to produce. One, I think he can, regardless. Two, are we going to see a full strength of Will Fuller? I don't know. Um, I'm not saying that's, you know, guaranteed him not to be good, but I would say we need to be more realistic about the timetable that we're seeing. And the other thing is like, you look at the offense too. Deshaun Watson has basically had next to nothing to throw to outside of DeAndre Hopkins, which I know is a pretty damn good thing to throw to, but DeAndre Hopkins and then just Will Fuller whenever he's on the field, which is are pretty rare instances at this point. And they don't have a pass catching tight end, uh, you know, outside of a third round rookie, Warring, who I actually like, but who's he's not gonna make that big of an impact in his rookie season. They don't have a pass catching running back. Lauren Miller barely caught any passes last year. Um, although you might think just because he's fast, he catches passes, he really doesn't. Which means even if Will Fuller is healthy, right, we could see a massive target funnel just towards these three top wide receivers. And we've seen Deshaun Watson throw to his wide receivers at a very high rate. It's what we saw in 2018. 66% of all Houston's throws went to the wide receiver position. Only the Rams, Minnesota, Tampa Bay had a higher rate of their passes go to wideouts. Over 20% of Watson's passes went to the slot in 2018. Kiki QT ran 75% of his routes from the slot, getting targeted at a rate of 20.5% on those routes. Not to mention, he ranked second among all NFL wide receivers last year in target separation per player profile, which is just the average yards of separation versus the closest defender when targeted. So as I said, that speed combined with the fact that he's in the slot is going to get him a ridiculous amount of separation. Obviously, Will Fuller staying healthy would damper Kiki QT's ceiling a little bit. But again, Fuller played in three of those five games from my earlier tweet, and he's clearly having problems staying on the field. He's coming off an ACL injury, which is very, very, very serious, of course. I think Kiki QT can produce regardless if Fuller's on the field or not. And I think he's in line for, like quietly in line for a very high volume role as Houston slot receiver, man. The touchdown upside, probably not too high, but who knows, man. Watson should be good for around 28 to 30 passing touchdowns in 2019, in my opinion. And uh, QT, if he ends up, you know, scoring seven touchdowns, which I don't think is out of his range of outcomes whatsoever, he's going to be a, like a borderline wide receiver too with upside in, especially in PPR leagues, and you're getting him around pick 100. So I love Kiki QT this year, and I'm probably taking him over Will Fuller, to be honest with you. Um, if you're going just straight off ADP and value, it's not even a question. I might even take QT straight up, which is probably not a popular opinion at this point. But he is my first wide receiver sleeper that I absolutely love grabbing at the ends uh, or the later rounds, at least in fantasy drafts. Speaking of fantasy drafts, if you do fantasy drafts with your friends, like season long leagues with your buddies, you know, you put the fucking draft board up on the wall and you put stickers on or whatever. Or if you're just in a season long league that you guys draft on Yahoo, y'all have to start using TeamStake. Like do yourselves a favor. All of my leagues use TeamStake.com. What it is, it's a way for everyone to pay their buy-in on online without having you as the commissioner or, you know, whoever is the commissioner of your league, just send them a link to teamstake.com. They will sign up absolutely free to sign up. They put your league on there. They really, it's not like you don't actually transfer your league over. You just name the league on there and they give you a URL to send out to all of your league mates. So gone are the days where you have to manually collect cash from your friends or you need each person to PayPal or Venmo. And then you need to keep track of where the money came from. And if you're like me, you start spending all their money throughout the year. And then you look back and you're like, fuck, I owe a thousand dollars to my friends that I shouldn't have spent in the first place. But that's where team state comes in. So if you are a commissioner, please go to teamstake.com. Please sign your league up there, which again, is completely free to use. You can customize the payouts. You can customize the buying settings. You can even have a late fee. So if you know you got some annoying ass friends, right? And they don't pay, or you have to collect two weeks into the season, put a late fee on there. So if they don't pay by a certain date, like a week before the draft, a month before the draft, they're going to have to pay an extra 10%, an extra $15 buying, whatever you want to do. It gives them incentive to pay on time. You don't have to worry about collecting people's money at all. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So please go check out teamstake.com. Thank you for sponsoring today's video, but that is a website that I've been using for all of my leagues. It's great for all of your season long leagues. It doesn't matter if you're drafting online, offline, 
Um, makes things very, 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 very easy. So teamstake.com, go sign up. Let's move to wide receiver number two. It's Marquez Valdez-Scantling of the Green Bay Packers. Currently going off the board after pick 100, between 100 and 110, around wide receiver 44. I made a video a few weeks ago covering guys getting picked in the late rounds of fantasy drafts that I believe have some sort of league winning upside. And among them, I listed Jerron Miles and NMVS. And I basically said the Green Bay wide receiver two role. Yes, I realize that's not a player. Uh, and it's going to be one of the more polarizing storylines of the summer, I think, whoever's going to win that job. And when you look at what Allison did last year. I want to take both sides of the story here, right? Allison was well on his way to a breakout 2018 campaign as a wide receiver too. I get it. He got hurt. He missed a bunch of time and he really never reclaimed that role. When he came back in, I forget what week he came back in, maybe like week eight or something, he was kind of relegated to playing behind MVS at that point. If you look at his pace as a wide receiver too over the first four games, it was 76 receptions, 1,156 receiving yards, and eight touchdowns. So monster numbers for a complimentary piece in an offense. But at the same time, we've always seen those numbers historically with whoever was the fantasy wide receiver too in an Aaron Rodgers offense, right? Those numbers that I just listed as his pace are pretty much on par with exactly what you see here for Aaron Rodgers' wide receiver two historically. The question now becomes, who is the wide receiver two in Green Bay? They've already told us. The people who have been watching the OTAs and maybe this might be more of a, a camp battle as it goes on, MVS is the wide receiver two there. He is starting over Allison in two wide receiver sets. So we know who the wide receiver two is, y'all. Now, it makes sense from a common sense standpoint. MVS is much more gifted athletically, right? If you look at Allison's profile, he's long. He's got the length, 6'3", 196 pounds, arm length, 79th percentile. But if you look at his workout metrics, he's a 4'6'7 guy. Puts him in the 21st percentile for weight adjusted speed score. Burst is below average. His agility score is terrible. Um, his catch radius ain't good. So he's really not built to play on the outside. He's not built to beat NFL cornerbacks. And I know he played really well last year. As I said, I, I gave you his per game numbers. If you're going to be shoved into that role, there, you know, you're going to produce with Aaron Rodgers. It's very hard not to produce at that point with Aaron Rodgers. When you look at MVS, he's a much better fit to dominate the outside. Six four. He's a little bit bigger. 10 more pounds of muscle on him, 206, 437 speed, 97th percentile weight adjusted speed score. The burst isn't there either, but he's, he makes it up with agility and catch radius. With a guy like Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers obviously is one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL, and he loves throwing the ball to the outside. I was looking some numbers up on sharp football stats. I was looking over the last like three years because um, you can actually break down throws and the percentage of throws by the area of the field. And the, the average NFL quarterback throws over the short middle of the field, which obviously this is not going to be 100% correct because slot receivers, all they do is not, it's not just like only running over the short middle of the field. But I think it speaks more to the point that like Aaron Rodgers threw the ball to the short middle of the field over the last like three or four years on about, I think it was like 10% of his throws, while the average NFL quarterback was around 18 to 19%. Aaron Rodgers throws to the outside on a very, very, very high percentage of his throws because he's very accurate. And he is one of the few quarterbacks that can do it accurately outside of the hash marks. So you can go check out those tools again on sharpfootballstats.com, which is one of my top resources listed in the Big Dogs Draft Guide, which I haven't plugged yet, but I think you should go check it out because the Big Dogs Draft Guide is literally the only thing you need for your 2019 fantasy football season. It's on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It launched on July 1st, but it will be updating throughout the entire summer. If you cop it now, you will still get all the updates. You will still be able to see what's in the draft guide. Not only my top resources, so all the resources and, and websites and apps and stuff that I use to create these videos, there's a whole article listed in there to teach you to be a better fantasy football player, to teach you how to use them correctly when you're doing your own research, as well as obviously the top rankings, top sleepers, top busts. You know, If you want all of my sleepers, they will be in there, whether it's wide receivers, running back, quarterback, tight end. Uh, must draft players as well as the big dogs bible which is like a 5,000 word piece which is going to come out in august because there's a lot more stuff to obviously happen between now and then it's like a 5,000 to 10,000 word article breaking down position by position exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft everything is in there i promise you it will not disappoint you go check it out bigdogsdraftguide.com let's get back to mbs right mbs is just better suited to um take over that role and be a better outside wide receiver i know like you could say that you want the slot receiver in this offense, but again, Aaron Rodgers doesn't really throw to the slot that much. I know Randall Cobb had that one big year like five years ago, but every other time that there's been multiple wide receivers performing, it's pretty much the wide receiver too uh, on the outside. And that other and that year where Randall Cobb produced, there was like no other wide receivers on the depth chart. Devontae Adams was in his rookie year, and we know how fucking bad Devontae Adams was when he came into the league. He was awful the first two years, like graded out as 
literally one of the worst wide receivers in the NFL. Amazing the flip uh, of the script that he made coming into the third year, fourth year, whatever. Um, but there was no one else there. It was just Randall Cobb running in the slot, and he was much more prepared to be a slot. He's built like a slot receiver, and he's m- way more faster, way more athletic than Geronimo Allison is. So it, it doesn't surprise me that Cobb actually you know blew up with Aaron Rodgers there. But we saw MBS get a ton of opportunity last year because um, both Allison and Randall Cobb missed significant time. He did really well while initially thrust into that starting role. Um, he had individual game lines of seven for 68 and a touchdown, three for 103, two for 45 and a touchdown, three for 103. Those are his first four games. So when you pace that out, they're just as good, probably better than what Geronimo Allison was pacing out for. And they did include two games of over 100 yards. Um, he had a 82% snap share in those first four games. He eventually hit the rookie wall though. And this is the only thing I'm a little bit hesitant towards when it comes to MVS over Allison is that MVS hit that rookie wall and he had every opportunity to like blow up last year and be Aaron Rodgers' number two guy. And uh, and it looked like he was going to be that. It looked like he was an absolute, you know, waiver wire wonder last year if you got him in those first four games. And then shit just kind of fell off. Over the last eight games, he topped 44 receiving yards one time. Now, there were rumors, there were a lot of reports coming out that them two were butting heads because MVS was running routes or whatever that Mike McCarthy was calling when Aaron Rodgers did not want his receivers to be doing that. So he kind of blackballed him and he stopped throwing him the ball, which led to him coming off the field more. I really don't know how true those rumors are, but I've seen a lot of reports um, that are kind of matching that. So I feel like there was probably something there, right? Where there's smoke, there's fire. So that can probably be put into context in terms of why he fell off so hard at the end of the year. What we're seeing out of camp so far is really, really good reports, really glowing reports straight from Aaron Rodgers, straight from the Hepe's mouth, man. He said, Marcus Valdez-Scantling, I quote, had a fantastic spring, has really stepped up, really stepped up as a guy who can be an every down player. Monday Morning QB's Albert Breer writes, MVS has quickly picked up new coach Matt LaFleur's system. Um, he is faster than the new staff has anticipated, and that makes sense because he ran a fucking 4.37. I don't know why you would anticipate anything less. Aaron Rodgers said he's one of the few guys on the field that runs on field as fast as like those times suggest. To keep the tide rolling, ESPN's Rob Domofsky reports MVS probably is the number two receiver, and he is running routes ahead of Geronimo Allison. That's huge news because that's, you know, uh, the Packers do run three wide receiver sets very, very often. But that's still, you know, an extra 10% or an extra 12% of snaps that MVS will have over Geronimo Allison. And, you know, when you're looking at 575 to 600 pass attempts and you take 10% or 12% of that, that's an extra 60 to 80 pass attempts on the year. Considering MVS is the two, let's give him like a target share of 13 to 15%. That's going to end up being like an extra 10 to 12 targets just off the baseline of playing on 10 to 12% more snaps than Allison. And... With that, putting that into context, as the number two receiver instead of the slot, like the average depth of target or the average depth of throw you're getting in the slot is almost like half the yardage that MVS would get. So not only are the targets there more, but those targets are obviously more downfield. And we know Aaron Rodgers is a ridiculously accurate downfield thrower and outside the hash marks thrower again. So combine his speed, MVS's speed, with Aaron Rodgers' accuracy down the field, I feel like MVS could easily bring home, you know, two, three, maybe even four if he gets lucky, like 30 to 40 yard touchdown receptions. Devontae Adams had zero touchdown receptions of more than 25 yards last year, which is fucking crazy. And you would assume that's going to be positive regression this upcoming season. I think MVS is a perfect complement because he's going to be a deep threat guy that can also be a possession receiver. Packers opted not to sign a single wide receiver in free agency or take one in the NFL draft, further confirming their confidence in the guys that they have there. And I'm not surprised, right? You have Devontae Adams as a sure one, but then MVS has that elite 437 top speed. He was a top three wide out last year in the NFL in terms of separation from his defenders, right? We had Kiki QT as the number two, MVS was the number three. Per PFF, he created separation on 70.3% of his routes, third highest rate among all NFL wide receivers. So Rodgers is damn accurate. He is going to chuck it down the field. Again, last year, his 4.2% touchdown passing rate. That's what we always look at when we want to see if quarterbacks' touchdown rates are going to regress or go higher the next year. His career average is between 6 and 6.5%. Last year, it fell down to 4.2%, by far the lowest of his career. So get that back up to 6% again, and you're looking at 35 to 40 passing touchdowns instead of 25, which I think a lot of them are going to go to Devontae Adams. We're looking at a monster fucking year, but MBS is going to be able to eat too. I actually drafted in the in the Scott Fish Bowl. I also drafted Devontae Adams with my second round pick and MVS with like my 10th or 11th round pick. So I stacked them, which I'm totally fine doing because I got MVS at such a good value. I'm all in on both Devonta Adams and MBS in 2019. I think you guys should be just based on on how he fits. At, how, he's such a better fit than Allison as a wide receiver too in this in this scheme. Uh, I'll grab a couple other guys 
from the draft guide that I didn't go as much in depth on. There's three sections. There's a, like the top guys that I love, which include like five or six wide receivers. And there's a section that like I like, but I didn't feel like writing an entire write-up on. And I probably have about 10 wide receivers in there. I won't go too crazy. Uh, there's Curtis Samuel of the Panthers. I don't really like him anywhere near as much as the industry does in terms of like a lot of people want Curtis Samuel over DJ Moore because the value gap, even at their value in terms of ADP, I still don't think I really want Samuel over DJ Moore. But Samuel had a really good rookie year, especially over the second half of the year. But again, Cam Newton was banged up and missed a few games. So it's hard to tell how much um, we can expect Cam Newton to really love Curtis Samuel. But when you look at Matt Harmon's reception perception of Curtis Samuel, he thinks he's like the next step on digs. He was really, really good at running routes last year, which is great. But I also think he's, Curtis Samuel is a player who I don't see ever being like a real possession receiver. And I feel like maybe this is me being naive, but I feel like he's more of a boomer bust guy. And you also look at the Panthers offense and it's like Cam Newton, how many like real fantasy options can he actually support? I mean, we have Christian McCaffrey, who's going to get over hundred targets. And we love DJ Moore to break out, right? And then we love Curtis Samuel to break out. It's like, something's got to give somewhere. This is Cam Newton's not going to attempt 600 passes and make three fantasy options. So I think uh, we need to kind of be realistic and temper expectations on all the people in this offense because Cam Newton uses a lot of his attempts on running. But I, I know I'm just like shitting on Curtis Samuel. I don't know why I have him in, in this video. But Curtis Samuel, I, I do think there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of people that I respect that really like the guy. So he's a good late round option. I've talked about Dante Moncrief on this podcast with Noah a bunch. I, I still think that he is the favorite to win the wide receiver two role. I'm not a fan of James Washington. I don't really like Deontay Johnson, who they picked in the third round. I, I don't think he's going to make a, an impact until minimum next year. They open up a lot of targets there with Antonio Brown, Jesse James leaving. They're a team that throws the ball downfield often, and they just throw the ball overall very often. Moncrief was a guy who has a monster athletic profile, and we saw him be a fantastic red zone weapon in Indy for his you know non-injury time there. He scored a lot of touchdowns. He became known as just a red zone weapon at some point, but I think he can play down the field. We saw it in, in glimpses of Jacksonville last year where he was putting up big games consistently. Um, but again, he was in Jacksonville playing with Blake Bortles. So I think moving over to Big Ben's side, and they don't really have that many red zone weapons there whatsoever. So Dante Moncrief can you know, put up some pretty good numbers, 60 for 808 touchdowns or something like that. He's in a similar spot to Devin Funches. And uh, I think Moncrief's athletic profile is a little bit more ready to be an all around possession receiver. So I like Moncrief. There are a bunch of other guys I have on here um, that I'm not going to read through all of them. If you want to see the entire list of all the positions, again, bigdogsdraftguide.com. That's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed the wide receiver sleepers video. If you did, make sure you tune in tomorrow. We've got a good breakdown with Noah. I think we're talking about the first round running backs and um, who we think is the top guy as well as mid round tight ends and some other good stuff. Wednesday's video will be must own running backs. I see that shit blowing up on YouTube, so I got to get my hand in the pot. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the channel. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're talking fantasy football the entire summer as well as into the season. That's all I got for you today. Cop that big dog draft guide at bigdogdraftguide.com. I love you.